Today, Dan and I are going to do a deep dive here into uh, OpenSSL. Uh, quick intro, my name is Frank Catucci. I'm the CTO and Head of Security Research at Invictus Security. Um, and as I mentioned with me here today, Dan Murphy. Yeah, and I am Dan Murphy. I'm the Head of Software Architecture at Invictus Security. I've been doing uh, security for a long time, and it's a big passion of mine. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is kind of some of the hype cycle that you have inside of the security landscape. We're going to take a look at OpenSSL, kind of a piece of software that's out there, that's ubiquitous, that we all know about, and kind of what happens when you have a wave. What happens when you have something that is kind of interesting from a security perspective? But this talk is not, you know, we're not going to go super, super deep, uh, unlike what the title says. We're actually going to talk about kind of the narrative and what you see behind the scenes of a CVE, what it means when you have something that's a high, what it means when there's something that's a critical. So this is kind of uh, an enjoyment talk. So you can kind of sit back and relax and be entertained and hopefully uh, maybe learn a thing or two here. Yeah. And also, too, uh, we'd like this to be interactive. So if, if hopefully at the end we do have questions or some kind of dialogue, uh, we're going to take a, a, a little bit of a deep dive, as Dan said, into some of the uh, payloads and the reasons things can be exploited or not. But overall, the agenda is really just an outline uh, what is OpenSSL, where it's used, the adoption rate, um, obviously some strengths, some weaknesses, and why OpenSSL, uh, even though it's so prevalent and we think about maybe some past uh, PTSD with OpenSSL, it's actually not so ugly. So we're gonna walk through these following steps here um, and then give you some uh, conclusion to hopefully walk away with. and. Uh, by request. Yeah, and as you can see from the slides, this is not a picture of how those of us who have flown over from the East Coast of the US feel, although that's kind of how I feel the inside with uh, with that uh, bit of stubble. But this is so named from the movie, so uh, let's see if we can get this to work. Hopefully most of you recognize this. There you go, and again, by request. I think that's uh, that, that's good enough. Uh, that's good enough. <laughs> we got it out of our yeah. system. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, real quick, brief, real brief overview. Um, some of the beginning slides will be very high level. Then we'll kind of dig deep down. So just bear with us. So, OpenSSL Project. Obviously, this is from directly from their site. Uh, they OpenSSL Project develops and maintains the OpenSSL software. Um, essentially, it's open source. Uh, it's a full feature toolkit. And it is used for general purpose crypto, but most importantly, and most utilized in secure communications. Um, obviously, it functions under these technical terms, uh, but that's what it is. <laughs> I'm sure most of you know. The most important part here uh, for me in the, in the beginning here is taking a look at the adoption rates, right? So if we go from 2011 to, oh, I don't know, 2020. If you will, you can see the adoption rate of open and SSL usage um, being very much uh, increasing, right? It, it, the volume of open SSL, we have some a little bit of decreases with uh, some of the newer um, um, ciphers and, and different things being available. But for the most part, we see a, a drastic rise in adoption. And this is pretty much uh, across the US and across the internet as a whole. And we'll get into some of the geographic differences uh, in a minute. But it's important to note here that, you know, if we look at the spike and then we look at, oh, you know, 2014, if you will, maybe something important happened with OpenSSL in 2014, it was right almost at the peak. And after that happened, it didn't necessarily dip, right? So you might have a little bit of a dip, but then the increase kept going. Uh, so I find that interesting. But if you can take a look at the volume there, uh, it's pretty incredible. And uh, the the, uh, the obligatory XKCD slide is here. Um, so OpenSSL truly is one of those pieces of software that's kind of foundational. You know, it's everywhere. You don't see it, but it is that little that little uh, Django block in the lower right that you see there that is just holding up so many different systems that are out there. So this talk is really about kind of what happens when you have a ripple. What happens when that little Django block starts to wiggle? And what's the story behind the scenes of those vulnerabilities? And, uh, you know, if you have that Django block fall, you know, what's the impact on the ecosystem? And to understand that, we kind of have to look at what was before. 
Yeah, and I was mentioning the adoption. And if you look at this from a geographic perspective, um, obviously we have very technologically advanced nations here leading the areas in, in the usage of open SSL. Uh, obviously, uh, United States, Japan, South Korea, China, et cetera. Um, now, the, the one thing I want to point here is the volume of usage or the volume of traffic that flows through any component that might be using SSL. And this is primarily in the public space, right? So this is publicly accessible. This isn't uh, taking into consideration the amount of traffic or the sensitivity of traffic flowing through open SSL on your internal networks or internal systems. So one thing to point out here is we look at the top one, right? So this is this is pulled recently in DC Inside. DC Inside is a Japanese version, essentially, of Reddit. Um, but if you look at the volume of requests, right, we're, we're talking 200 million monthly requests um, that flow through um, OpenSSL here, right? And the next one down, uh, another considerably important one is Forbes. Some of you may be on, you know, members or read the uh, Forbes Technology Council, et cetera. So an important amount of technologically advanced data, again, flowing through here at 100 million flows or monthly visits through OpenSSL um, every month. That's 100 million a month. Um, and down here, as I mentioned, just a little bit of a break of vertical. So science and education leading the way. I think the others there is important to point out because the others in the being the majority, meaning that it's probably more marketing and e-commerce related, right? Public sites from that perspective. But again, just a, a good insight that science and education really taking up the majority of the industry verticals there. So we've established that OpenSSL is everywhere. So in order to kind of understand what goes through the mind of folks that are trying to monitor and react to potential vulnerabilities that are there, um, we wanted to share personal experiences of what came before. So later on in this talk, we're going to do a deep dive into one of the vulnerabilities that happened was a spooky Halloween surprise from last fall. And uh, it was something, you know, that we'll kind of go into, but to understand the context of why it was so impactful and why everyone was kind of freaking about this, freaking out about it, it's important to understand what came before. So that CVE, the one we'll be discussing in detail, you know, may ask, you might ask, why is this bug so interesting? Frankly, by itself, outside of context, you know, it's not. Um, security bugs happen all the time, and oftentimes they're fixed and they don't make it into the wild. You know, typically they're found and they're fixed and it's quiet. It doesn't cause too much trouble. Now, I come at this from the perspective of a software engineer. So I'm someone who builds security tools, who writes code. And frankly, you see zero days like all the time. You know, you can have a zero day, zero day that's inside of your editor and it's an off by one and, you know, you just fix it and it just goes away. So these things are actually kind of small, but uh, so usually these are like, you know, they're like small waves that are kind of lapping against the shores. They're found, they're fixed. But every so often, you have a rogue wave. And that's why many of us were hanging out on Slack around Halloween of last year. We we're feverishly speculating about what might come. Uh, maybe some of us were so excited that we had uh, rigged up a, a little script to do a while true git pull and, and diff and see whether or not uh, if there were any changes that had been reported to play uh, like a Carmen Berena O Fortuna, like a big <laughs> epic piece, just so we could get out of a meeting and announce we had to go deal with something that was important. Um, so the, the answer to why this stuff is important, it's in context, it's in the history. So on that day, so many of us were feeling a sense of deja vu or more accurately, it was a sense of PTSD. So almost 10 years ago today, there was an RFC that was introduced and that RFC was numbered 6520, uh, RFC 6520 and had kind of a very esoteric name. It was transport layer security TLS and DTLS, uh, heartbeat extensions. So at the time, this was kind of the sort of weird corner case RFC. It really only appeared to kind of the hypo-focused turbo nerds that were very into open source cryptography. Um, it wasn't on anyone's radar. Now, around that time, I was working on the data path of uh, in the cryptography level uh, layer of the Cisco AntiConnect VPN client. Last I checked with the guys who were working on that code, you know, my janky code was still there in the data path uh, encrypting things. And every few weeks, I actually still see that piece of software that icon kind of bouncing up on somebody's screen. And I'm reminded that even today, how many millions of packets are flowing through my code, which is uh, frankly kind of terrifying. And uh, But at that time, I was in that space. So I was maintaining kind of patches for OpenSSL. I had spent more hours than I cared to kind of examining oh, some OpenSSL security vulnerabilities, 
you know, figuring out whether or not they were applicable to the product that I was working on at the time. You know, I was a cryptography turbo nerd at that time when all this stuff happened. Um, and Frank, actually, if you could, what, what were you doing yeah. around that time? Uh, excellent point. So uh, during this time, and that was that 2014 spike that I showed earlier, or the, I would say more accurately, the non-dip, right? Um, I happened to be doing an uh, application security consulting uh, engagement at one of the U.S.'s largest um, home remodeling companies uh, or vendors, if you will. Um, so it's a store brand chain. Um, and we were sitting in the office. Um, Heartbreed, Heartbleed just came out. Um, and we just started to toy around with some proof of concept code. Um, using that proof of concept code, we were sitting in a boardroom um, with a lot of terrified folks as we were pulling unencrypted data traffic from their live e-commerce sites full of usernames, passwords, PII, and PCI data being credit cards, et cetera. Um, so we were doing this in the boardroom of that retailer. Um, I was probably beginning of November uh, timeframe um, in 2014. And the look of, I would say the look of dread uh, that, you know, coming around that boardroom, say like, oh, well, we're PCI compliant. Well, it doesn't really matter when I'm pulling plain text stuff right out of the uh, data streams. Um, and we were using a hotspot, one of those big block hotspots. So we were not on a corporate network. We were doing this from public IP space in the boardroom. Um, that inevitably leads to PTSD when you see, oh, my God, there's a critical vulnerability coming out in OpenSSL. Yeah. You're thinking the worst. Yeah. And if we kind of fast forward from two years that that RFC that I talked about, it was much, much more widely known. A lot of that is due to the logo that you see on the screen. I mean, it's not just the logo. It's also the kind of the terrible CV that went along with it. But uh, actually, the logo is probably a pretty big part of it. If anybody ever like writes a clickbait article that's, um, you know, about top 10 security vulnerability uh, logos that AppSec managers don't uh, want to know, you have to use like number one shell shock will amaze you. Um, but like that logo was so popular that it kind of set off speculation. Like you could see, you would go like to the, the, the news at night. I remember seeing stuff that was in security was like on TV, right? It was big. Um, and I remember where I was when I first saw Heartbleed in action. Um, I was actually just, uh, I was at a startup. So we had, we had like just split off from the mothership and this time, you know, we were going to do things differently. So we were free of our corporate masters, free to kind of like write code securely, do it the right way. And we had done all the right things. You know, we had like segregated our processes. We had like, you know, drop privs where appropriate, you know, group jails for everything. It was like, you know, we had taken pride in this fortress that we had built. And I remember sitting there after hours and taking a look at this code at the startup and I downloaded the POC and I ran it. And uh, I was targeting, I pointed this thing at this fortress of software that we had just built. It was a fort fortress of software that I was, I was kind of proud of. Um, I remember just like my jaw dropping. I had Wireshark open and I looked at this, uh, you know, dropped in a filter for TCP, the uh, port equals 443, just to see the encrypted traffic. And there, kind of staring at me, there was uh, in plain text, there was authorization colon basic and then some base 64. And I knew it was coming. I knew it was in there, but I almost didn't believe it, right? It was almost too good to be true. I base 64 decoded that and I saw the string ADMIN colon. And then afterwards, uh, a very high entropy, you know, a very horse battery stable, high entropy password. But there it was. It was like the master keys and it was in plain text, just visible. And I had this sinking feeling that I was running this POC pointing at it against a box that I had. And then anyone on the internet could be doing that same thing at that yeah. same moment. It was that moment of terror. So like we had this master secret that is just magically, just magically kind of like plucked out of the memory of the, of the other side of something that I had built and it freaked me out. Now, Heartbleed fell short of full RCE. So it was not remote code execution, um, but it did do a tremendous damage as a critical severity vulnerability in open SSL. So this broke the internet last time. That is what is in mind as we took a look at this rumored bug that was coming out. So some of you may know this character here. Um, he's from the better office. No offense. but uh, uh, So anyhow, uh, real quick demo, um, one that we put together that just, again, this history lesson is very important to know the sensitivity um, of the bugs we deal with and 
what we do when we find open SSL critical vulnerabilities that are about to be released. So you can see here, um, obviously we're gonna type in a, a username, we're gonna create a password, which is password one. You said, how do we know that? We're gonna tell you, we're gonna show you in the console, verify through the JavaScript. In fact, we typed password one. Okay, it's there. Not just dots. No, not just dots. We really type password one. At the same time, we kind of hop back out, run into the console, run our proof of concept into this app. And you can see there the dump, basically password one coming from that extracted uh, bit of data. How that data came through, we're going to kind of give you some details, but that just shows you that that wasn't a TLS connection. Um, so that was a connection using encrypted uh, traffic that was able to pull that directly out of memory in plain text from that website. Yeah, so the way that Heartbleed worked is that it committed kind of a fatal, fatal sin. It, the implementation trusted the client. You never trust the client when you're on the network. Um, Heartbleed basically worked by sending uh, kind of like an ICMP, like a ping request. Uh, there was a basic functionality that said, hey, when I send something to you, can you kind of just read back what I gave you? Uh, it's a good way to detect like path MTU, uh, you know, the pipe's too small to transmit packets. It's a useful, useful mechanism to keep a connection alive. So stateful firewall doesn't close it down. But, uh, that what that heartbeat did is you could say, Hey, I totally just sent you 65 K of data. Can you just uh, read back what I sent to you? And, uh, even though that, that, uh, network byte order thing inside of the packet said, this is 65 K. It would actually be short. It would be like five characters. And what would be read back? What would be read back is kind of the interesting bits. Um, it would come back as raw heap. And raw heap, that was really kind of like your delicious sushi-grade data that was coming back that represented the scratch buffer where all of the ciphertext was decrypted into plain text. So what that meant is you would be able to see encrypted traffic that nobody else had sent. And it was just served up to you on a plate. Um, and that's what you kind of just saw in the demo there. So that when we saw this CVE 2022, uh, 3786, this was rumored to be a critical open SSL vulnerability. So that's what's running through everyone's heads. Um, it was actually pre-announced. So it was announced as a critical. And the only information that I'm sure a lot of people here also saw this same thing is that something is coming. There is a wave on the horizon. It's going to hit. Uh, no one had any information. And our Slack channels were rife with speculation. We were trying to figure out uh, how to compute signatures based on hashes of, of SSL handshakes, what we could be, do. But nobody really knew any of the details. All we knew is that it was going to be bad. Yeah. And one thing to point out here, it was the first critical open SSL that we were going to see since Heartbleed. Um, if you could imagine the, the amount of preparation and panic in everybody uh, – internal corporations, et cetera, for, from our side, right? We have, our side was twofold, one internal and two providing tests for our clients, um, our customers. So we did not know what was coming. So let's dive into that. So we're at kind of the peak of the hype train and everyone is freaking out. Nobody even knows what we're going to detect, but already brainstorming schemes on what we would do, how we would detect it. And sometimes when we have hype, I don't know if anyone here has uh, encountered hype in the world of security, but uh, the best way that you fight that is with uh, real world investigation. So what we did is we kind of dug in and we played around with it. And if there's one thing that we kind of take away from this talk is that there's nothing quite like in much in the same way that seeing is believing. I remember where I was those eight years ago when I ran Heartbleed for the first time and I saw it. When we get these severe, high critical sevs out there, actually playing with it and understanding it, it helps us put it in context. It helps us understand the narrative that is behind the bug. And that's what we'll kind of talk about today is what is the, what's the narrative behind this? What's the story? So this, uh, this, uh, 2022 3602, what is all this, all of this hype after the actual patch dropped, you know, and that, uh, that operatic Carmen Berena got triggered. If you actually go in and take a look at it, there were a lot of changes. So there was, um, you know, 3,133 lines of diff. Um, however, though this critical, this formerly critical severity came down to one character. Now, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, so I'll kind of point it out, but uh, line 183, there's a check and it says in the original code, if written out is greater than max out, uh, you know, then do a thing. Let's just stop. It's basically control logic inside of a loop. And uh, that's an off by one error. 
like before when I was saying how so many of these have born and died inside of the IDE in just the course of a day's work, this is one that shipped. And this is one that shipped that uh, allowed an arbitrary uh, overflow of a few bytes. So let's kind of dig in and let's see, well, what's the story behind this? What can we do? Why was this originally a critical? And why did it get downgraded? So to kind of explain this stuff, right? And uh, I'm going to try to avoid popping up a bunch of code on the screen. I kind of want to talk through the narrative and the the, the thought process side of it. There's a word. Uh, I like words. And uh, Syzygy is kind of a cool one. Um, it is useful in the context of this discussion because it refers to getting different orbital bodies to align. It's kind of hard to see in that picture, but you've got kind of like different planets that happen to be at the same uh, the same orbit. So you can kind of draw a line up from the horizon and you can see them. And the analogy that we're going for here is that in order to exploit this bug, we do have to move heaven and earth into perfect alignment. But let's take a look at it. It's still a high. So what does that actually mean? What's should, the story behind this? Should it be the? Well, <laughs> that's, that's a discussion for the end. Um, so first thing that we're going to take a look at is the attack vector. Now, uh, kind of just by a show of hands in the audience, um, how many of you have seen the certificate dialogue that pops up in a browser when you are requested by another side to authenticate using a client cert? So I see a few hands. Uh, now, another question. How many people have seen that on publicly accessible non-internal sites? I see hands have decreased. So we still have some, but a marked decrease in the number of raised hands. So that simple criteria, that it's an attack inside of the certificate handshake with a client cert, that immediately disqualifies like 99% of sites. Um, you know, the same site that I attacked uh, so many years ago, my own my own code, wouldn't have been vulnerable. Yeah. Um it's also, we also have to take a look at what was vulnerable. So there's a relatively narrow window for this. Um, this vulnerability affected OpenSSL 3.0, uh, which was released in uh, just last year. So it was in, in kind of the, the recent era. That was like two weeks ago, right? 2021. So this is something that's relatively recent. So we're already now talking about the set of persons that are using client certificates and the set of persons that are using client certs and keeping their OpenSSL up to date. As we all know, everyone like patches software and keeps up to date. So that should be everyone, right? Yeah, yeah no. <laughs> it's uh, Again, we're looking at a subset of a subset. Now, to make this even more complicated, you have to understand where this happens. Like, it's super easy to look at a bit of code and say, hey, yeah, there's a buffer overflow here. And that's serious. But you got to understand, you know, what's the story behind the noise and whether or not that can actually be exploited. So this actually requires to have um, – it has to be a valid certificate. And we'll kind of go through where that happens inside of the sequence to show where this is in the cycle of kind of the, the typical chat that happens between a client and server to create a secure SSL channel. So we have two people here. So Frank, yeah. you want to be the client here? Why not? So I'm going to basically approach the server and say, hey, server, here I am. I'd like to connect. Here are the Cypher suites that I support that I would like to talk in. What are we going to do? Yeah, so we next have a very small font, which is why you get this uh, interactive version. So you next get back a server hello. And the server hello says, I've decided of the set of Cypher suites that you've presented to me that we're going to be talking uh, AS uh, Galois counter mode. And we're going to be using you know this for integrity. We're going to be using this. So you get this authoritative the response that comes back from the server that says, this is how it's going to be. Additionally, what the server is going to send back is a server certificate. So it's going to say, here are my credentials. They are signed by a mutual PKI, a bit of public key infrastructure that says I am who I am. Now, the dash box that you see here is what is a little bit weird about the attack vector for this particular bug. It requires the server to then say, client cert requested, which is a uh, handshake message that says, well, you know, I've showed me, I've showed you my credentials. Now you have to show me yours. And this is where the client will then submit something that has something interesting. I'm going to submit trash to Dan. Yeah, so the client sends back something interesting, right? Client is going to send back something that has uh, an exploit inside of it. And not only that, but this is happening after we've already done validation. That's important. Yeah, and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of go into that a little bit. So when the, when the server goes and starts to verify the client, it has to say, hey – who issued this certificate? And that's when the server's next response is, well, it dies. Ah, it blows up, and that is where the exploit can happen. Um, before we can kind of dig into the details of that, kind of a quick uh, quick refresher on uh, Punicode. And Punicode is something that allows us to take 
kind of antiquated systems that are uh, not really built for um, uh, multi-byte uh, UTF-8 characters and kind of shoehorn them into the process. So uh, Punicode allows us to take an internationalized domain. In this case, I've appended a .ie on the end to uh, you know to make it applicable here. But we have kind of a, a table flip, you know, emoji that is saying, "Hey, this is a this is a domain." Um, you know, table flip that IE, which uh, I don't know if that's registered, but I should have done that for the talk. Um, how do we represent that as a series of encoded bytes? So if we look at this on the, you know, in a in a, a hex dump, you'll see a few things that are interesting. You see the round sides of the face of the table flip guy. That's our parentheses and our other parentheses. And I want to point out that the number of characters that are between sandwiched between those two rosy cheeks are actually not uh, just five bytes, right? So we have like arm, space, eye, shocking O face, and then like another eye. But that's a whole bunch of bytes that are between those. Those aren't going to fit inside of standard encoding, which is why when it, go, it comes time for us to put them into a standard UTF-7 kind of ASCII encoding, it gets weird. Um, and that weirdness is kind of exemplified by the format that you see there. We have uh, a prefix, which is XN dash dash. That denotes, it's kind of like a clue to the other side. Yeah, warning, it's time to parse some stuff. So after that, you have the ASCII portion of the sequence, but it's all concatenated. So we kind of took the face and we sucked the face out then we encoded the face and we put it on the end. And that gobbledygook that you see on the end, that is kind of a series of indices into the ASCII string where you're going to insert some data as well as kind of a code point encoding. And what this means is complexity. And from a security complexity, uh, from a security perspective, uh, from a security perspective, complexity is what invites exploitability, right? This is going to be funky code, hard to audit, hard to get right. And uh, guess what happens? So the payload location. And this is actually very, very key because if you look at this through a keyhole and you think about it, it's like, all right, we can overwrite some bytes, but what has to happen? We have to shift another planet into alignment to make all of this work out. The second planet that we have to shift is that the root CA, the issuing certificate that issues the client cert actually has to have been issued with a special name constraint, uh, an extension that identifies the domain name. That's our table flip.ie that you see there uh, has to be inside of a trusted issuing cert. We then also need to convince a certificate authority to issue a leaf certificate, a client cert that also has something fishy inside of it. It's to have, it has to have this um, special OID, this um, uh, 13615589, that is an SMTP UTF 8 mailbox saying, hey, this certificate belongs to this internationalized domain. So that is two very weird things that we have to do. So we have to convince a certificate authority to kind of issue us malicious certificates that contain bytecode. Yeah, one thing there, um, it, all of this stuff needs to happen to be able to run this exploit that was launched initially as critical. Um, but one question is, if I can compromise the CA, the root CA, right? If I can compromise the root CA, am I bothering with this? Probably not. Yeah. Uh, we're just being in the middle. If you presume the ability to mint your own CAs, yeah, you're just going to give something that has a common name equal to the site and just do a plain old boring man in the middle attack to steal credentials. This is kind of like you're doing a lot to be able to like do a little, but let's keep going because there's more. Um, so if we dig down again, I don't want to go into too many details here, but the front door through this is in funky code. Uh, it's funky code in uh, punicode.c ultimately that is going to parse that weird gobbledygook that we saw before. Now it's coming in late in the process. So we're already pretty far in the SSL handshake. We've already said, well, this is a valid license from a good issuing authority. And that's where the attack is going to be inside of it. So, uh, but another aside, let's talk for a minute about memory safety, Frank. So let's talk about memory safety and let's talk about language. And I'm not up here to bash C, if you will. Uh, but, um, all right. Thanks. So, but we'll take a look at the languages and the total vulnerabilities of the open source uh, languages here, or, or excuse me, the the open source vulnerabilities per language. Now, when if I didn't show you this picture, you might automatically be thinking of your head in your head of other major kind of vulnerabilities that came out, right? So you're like, okay, well, I know PHP is bad. Um, I know Java has its issues, but to see C up there is important. Um, there was an earlier talk today from a, a gentleman doing Kubernetes that there was another memory uh, leak kind of exploit available. 
Um, but what was shown there was also, uh, if the code was written in C, that, that there was a possibility of RCE, and it wasn't affected in Golang. So what I'm showing you here is just a breakdown. And when we look at these open source and legacy, and I use the word legacy not in a negative way, meaning that these very established backbone of the kind of internet programs uh, or open source software that are utilized across the web for various purposes, this one being encryption, 47% um, of these vulnerabilities are coming from C. So as we look at the web and we look at the new transitions to new languages, et cetera, but we're still building on this backbone of very much legacy or older code, we have to keep this stuff in mind, right? So we have to keep in mind that there are targets. We know C is bad with memory, um, and this is going to continue to be a target. Now, it wasn't this time. It wasn't Heartbleed 2 or whatever it was, but it could have been. And if it was, we were going to be probably in for a, a bit of pain and more PTSD. But just wanted to call this out in case you were wondering of how this stacks up versus other open source software or other libraries that support the modern internet and the target for memory leak and things like that that are very consistent for C code. Yeah, and another interesting statistic. Um, so Chrome, uh, Chromium has kind of taken a look at what percentage of, of bugs are related to memory safety issues of security bugs, and that's 70%. Uh, the Linux kernel is about 65% of those vulnerabilities that are security uh, nature. They come from unsafe memory access, and that pattern is repeated. It hovers around 65 70% across a lot of different projects. So it's a very real need, and this was another instance of it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about stacks. Um, so stacks are kind of the way that we can allocate some memory uh, in a traditional C program. They've got a couple different characteristics. Um, as we kind of put things up, they're like the plates that we have when we all went and grabbed lunch earlier. You kind of stack them up and you allocate new local storage. You pop things off when you're done. And they're a way to kind of like have quick access to some easy memory. Now, they, while they grow up, they actually grow down in uh, in memory. And what that means is that, uh, sorry, the memory increases as you kind of go down in the stack. And what that means is that when you have a nice stack, uh, everything fits inside of its box, right? Um, you will have uh, lots of things that are just kind of contained in its own polite memory cell, and everybody is happy. But as you can see in the diagram there, next to that memory, uh, there's some interesting stuff that touches the stack in a lot of common uh, representations. This, of course, like if anyone's in the audience has kind of written buffer overflows before, it's a little bit simplified, but um, this is showing kind of a 32-bit stack, a little bit simplified, but down there we have the saved frame pointer. That's kind of the map of where you were because when it's time to finish a subroutine, you have to go back and start doing what you were doing before. I showed that call stack earlier that showed how we got into the vulnerable open SSL uh, code. After we finish the Puna code, yeah, we're going to pop out and we're going to do the thing that we were doing before. But what happens if the bad, what happens if someone takes that place that you were supposed to be and insert something? Now, in this case, our attack allows us to override just four bytes that less than that, uh, sorry, less than equals that was a less than that's going to let us go a little bit too far. So there you'll see, I'm sure everyone remembers the, uh, the binary representation of our table flip guy, but that's that inside of that, uh, that box, but it's gone too far. And here we have some junk, some dead beef that has been pushed onto the frame pointer. Now that's the bad, that can crash, right? That can cause some stuff, but we have to consider the ugly. And the ugly is the case where an adversary uses this. And this is kind of classic Stack Overflow stuff. I would highly encourage anyone to go check out, um, there's a great old flat, uh, frack article um, that by Aleph One that's excellent on the subject. It's good, good reading. It's like, it's foundational literature, right? It's good stuff to be familiar with. the title? I will in a second. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, uh, but here we can kind of push a fake frame and that fake frame can in, uh, contain a payload. So it can have inside of it some shell code protected and layered on either side by kind of a sea of no ops that allows some an attacker to kind of jump with some confidence to a region of memory. But um, we can return into this fake frame. And it's that thing at the end that's scary, that uh, fake red address. So if we can kind of jump into a frame and we can fake, hey, where do we go after we return from this function? That's where an attacker could craft a very strange looking one of these uh, Unicode addresses. And that's where we could actually start to do uh, some damage. So if we had a domain here uh, in a strange place, we would actually be able to influence the stack of the open SSL on the other side, in theory, to remotely execute code. But we're going to kind of keep going and show how that requires us to move planets. Now, one of the things that's always good whenever you have these hype things, 
it's very good to think about, well, how's this, what's an attacker actually able to do with this? And you kind of have to take that mindset of, well, is this, you know, how, how much of this is real and how much of this is, um, you know, just noise. And so I kind of did something where I grew, this is a little bit, uh, this is the source code that's actually affected. A little bit tough to see in the back, but I've annotated down the, uh, at the bottom the actual buffer, the actual piece of OpenSSL that is vulnerable. So if we are able to smash something, what can we smash? And from the perspective of an attacker, what's interesting that's in the neighborhood? Like what's nearby? If you remember our map that we showed of stacks before, the attacker is going to be interested in saying, well, if I can arbitrary influence memory, you know, what's in my neighborhood? And that's the answer lot. is... It's not much. In this instance, the only thing that was there was padding. I mean, there's a local variable that we see that's right next to it. It's like the return from the function, not particularly interesting. But all of the compilers that were tested, it was just dead air. So even though there was the capability to overflow something, it didn't go anywhere interesting. It could never hit the frame pointer. And because of that, an attacker could never craft that sort of malicious payload required to be able to do some damage. But, you know, let's move another body into alignment and let's, let's consider a world where those planets did line up. You know, what if we actually had something where this open SSL puny code was right next to a juicy part? You know, what could we do if we artificially moved all of our planets into alignment? So what we did is create a kind of a simplified version of that code. Um, and this was done in the spirit of exper experimentation to understand, hey, what do modern compilers do? How does it actually work? And that, again, the takeaway from the talk is really to embrace that spirit of exploration, to try things out, to kind of prove for yourself, to say, you know, is this real or is this something that is uh, a little bit more hyped up than it is? So here's our sample code. Um, again, the, the takeaway from this one is that we've got that same while written out is greater than max size. We've got the same error there and we kind of have a fake uh a fake buffer. And what we're doing is simulating this first by introducing a variable that's going to be in the real estate that we would want to be able to hit. So uh, first thing that we did is, and don't worry, we'll narrate what this is for the uh, too much code here. What we're going to do here is show by default, if we take this tiny bite sized thing, we try to put something into those buffer that's bigger. So we have that OX dead beef, OX debacle, uh, OX accolade, and OX leap code. What we want to do is take that final thing, that leap code, and smash that variable. So we're going to run it in a debugger. We're just going to build it first and see exactly what we get out. So this should be a pretty textbook case of being able to overwrite that variable. However, we don't get that. What we instead get is something else. By default, no, we, uh, we can't overflow it. Something stops us. And the question is, well, why? You know, what, what happened? Modern there, software. Yeah, our good stack is supposed to look like what you see on the right. However, it's not laid out that way. So if we kind of do some math and find out where that vulnerable, that location that we thought was going to be in the proper real estate, simply not where it was supposed to be. It had moved. And in fact, if we do a little bit more experimentation and try to figure out, well, where exactly is it? We can try to change the size of that buffer and see that modern compilers are actually doing something special. They're taking precautions and they're deciding to say, look, this is a buffer and it's above a, a certain size. Let's actually put it into a special spot. Here, uh, what I just showed was by reducing that to a single byte for the array of that uh, of that buffer, we actually can overwrite it. We can get debacle to go into our uh, our blast radius and prove that aha, someone is doing something clever here to protect against it. So, if we try to take a look and find out, well, what's being done? Why doesn't this work? What's that last planet that we need to move into alignment for OpenSSL to be vulnerable to RCE? Well, by default, uh, the compiler on which I was doing this experimentation. It, uh, if we do a backtrace, we can find that it's in this function called stack check fail. And what that means is that there's a protection that's built in that is actually explicitly looking for a buffer overflow and explicitly saying, hey, 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 we are not going to continue execution because something bad has happened. We are going to halt this program before it gets worse. Now, there's still a vulnerability. That's a done out of service, right? So you can kind of like remotely induce a crash in the other side. But what you can't do is start to use that for RCE. So uh, let's go a little further and let's see if we can get something else. Um, what we're going to do now is introduce uh, a way to turn off the shields. So there's this dash N uh, dash F no stack uh, protector. We're going shields down here. And now we're going to 
see how much we're moving the moon into alignment because we're presuming a world where someone is compiling open SSL and explicitly turning off security checks, right? So this is a pretty heavy lift into, uh, into, or into alignment. Now, if we run it this time, we get something kind of interesting. Um, we are able to overflow something and we can actually get an interesting value into that blast radius. That's kind of how I expected it to work at first. And I was pleasantly surprised that, well, we're starting to get secure by default. Um, we're still not there, but it's getting better. So that stack protection, that helped us. That saved us. Um, we're actually able to put something interesting into the memory. Now, if we want to keep going and we want to try to uh, see if we can actually smash something, there's some more things that we'll do. Um, smashing stacks in 2023 is not really quite as profitable nor as fun as once it was. And that is my reference to smashing. You stack. waited a long time. <laughs> I did. Wait, I mean, God, that's just too long to wait for that title. Right? Yeah, but no, it's a uh, smashing the stack for fun and profit is the thing that I'm referring to. Um, but again, if we try to smash this, we can kind of do something else. And here, uh, if we kind of make a minor modification, remove those bytes, we can see whether or not we can get a little bit further. And we can. And then finally, we'll crash because we read too far. What we've done now over here in this bad is. We can overwrite this stack and we can override it enough that um, we actually mess up the inputs to the function. We go too far and we get a bad access because we've read from a page of memory that we're not supposed to have access to. So if we introduce kind of one more thing, um, what we can finally do is artificially kind of simulate an attacker who has entered into the Goldilocks zone of Puni code exploits where they have a buffer that's not too big, it's not too small. And uh, here, if we have our kind of Goldilocks code with a limit, if we go and run this, with shields down, presuming that we've already had client certs, all of these massive presumptions, then you can see that we actually do something somewhat interesting. The backtrace that we see down here, um, which I'll kind of zoom into here, it's got a lot of hex, but this hex is interesting because that frame, that magic number, that uh, 16 FD FF 5 F8, that is something that you'll see a few lines above. That's a value that has been written from that untrusted buffer. That's something where we were able to influence the frame pointer. So after a lot of shenanigans, um, if we wanted to take this a little bit further and make it real ugly, that's where we could plop in some shell code. That's where we could actually get something to do something interesting. But even then, there's still a little bit more that is needed. Um, what are some of the mitigations for, for this? Let's talk about this for a second. So if anyone's wondering how this presentation kind of, kind of came about, um, this is essentially – uh, Dan and I's Slack conversations uh, dur <laughs> during the um, dur during the release of that uh, vulnerability. Uh, so there is a, a, a ton of Slack out there that hopefully um, is lost forever. Um, <laughs> that that really walks through this. Then ended up being a blog post that ended up being this talk when uh, we were like, how can we how how far can we go with this? Well. One of the things we had to do, and we were talking about Syzygy and all those planets aligning, is taking a look at things that we can do to mitigate this or that are already out there mitigating these type of attacks, right? We know that canaries and, and stack guards are already in place, right? They're written in memory before the return pointer. We know that that's going to make it essentially tamper resistant. I'm not going to say tamper proof, but tamper resistant. So those canaries and those stack guards are already in place that need to be disabled for this attack to occur. ASLR is another one. Um, these days, Brute, even brute forcing ASLR is not really a, a viable solution. Um, having a randomization of the address space layout, um, and you know, you kind of saw a little bit of that earlier, but having the randomness of that and knowing where that is going to occur and targeting that exact address space is going to be almost impossible. Uh, not impossible, almost impossible. Um, and then the, uh, the NX that you saw there, the non-executable stack, right? The non-executable stack is going to automatically, again, be blocking that or have a flag to say, this is not going to be allowed to be uh, executed in those levels. So beyond the things that we that we had to do to align the planets, meaning that the root CA, the leaf certificate, the client cert, et cetera, all of that fun stuff, we still have to deal with mitigations that are probably in place by default. And if they're not, they're available. And at the code level, we know there are the stack guards, the canaries, obviously, the uh, ASLR, even modern ASLR in being brute force doesn't even work anymore. And then obviously the non-executable NX stack. At a code, at a non-code level, 
Um, there's also easier ways to do this, right? So, you know, at a non-code level, I, I saw people out there immediately pushing out of like virtual patches for a WAF or an IPS. Um, they were doing this remotely um, in their various kind of edge infrastructure. Um, even, you know, I would say I, I, I didn't see it personally, but one could even do it through a RASP if you had one, if, you, if anyone ever had one. Um, a RASP could be, <laughs> can do it in runtime. Uh, IPS rules, send TP, TCP reset packets, et cetera. All of this is possible there. And then finally, the easy one, um, you know, either patch or don't patch, but don't be on version three, but uh, yeah, patch and upgrade your libraries if possible. So these are easy mitigations that are often in the way of these exploits, even with, you know, all of those planets aligning at that uh, specific instance. So, so. Yep. Downgrading this from critical was absolutely the right call. And uh, I give a lot of respect for that. Uh, however, I don't necessarily know that it's still a high vulnerability from what we showed you. Uh, the amount of complexity that would be required to exploit this does not indicate a high level of uh, value in my, in my opinion. Uh, but it was downgraded and that's was the right call. Another thing I want to point out um, is a quick shout out to researchers in the research community. So um, at Invicti, I have a team of researchers that work for me that do things similar to this. However, I would like to just send a, a shout out there to Polar Bear in particular. Um, researchers that are out there doing the right thing and discovering and disclosing uh, exploits and vulnerabilities in a responsible manner um, are key, right? This is OWASP. We all contribute to open source software, libraries, projects, etc. Um, and our researchers also support those efforts in different ways. And if it wasn't for these researchers uh, and the researchers that work for myself and all the researchers around the world, um, being able to disclose these, these attacks like this, or even like Heartbleed, may have been disclosed to nation states or, or enemies or other people like that that may use it behind the scenes or maybe our government. Uh, someone else uh, using it behind the scenes uh, to do nefarious or criminal activity. So uh, a big shout out to the research community, especially polar bear in this instance. And also this is probably not the last that we've heard of this code. As I said, complexity invites vulnerability. As I was finalizing these slides, uh, I noticed last week that the same bit of code that I was poking around doing the research for this and cons uh, V3 dot C there's another one, right? So there's another buffer overflow. This one was never teased as a critical, so that's good. But again, complex code where you have to write a parser and you're writing kind of a parser in a memory unsafe language, you know, it's not the last that we've probably heard of this. But for this particular one, the planets definitely would have to align to make this an RCE. We know that you have to have a compromised certificate authority. You have to have a compromised client certificate. Uh, you have to have a server that's requesting a client cert from the other side all kind of strange things. Um, you have to have an open SSL that is in within a very kind of narrow vintage of open SSL, you know, recent, but you know, not something that everyone is running. You have to have a mythical stack layout that puts that prime real estate of something to smash in an interesting location. It wasn't. Yeah. You, you need to have neighbors, uh, that have interesting windows to look in and, uh, none of the neighbors did. So even if you were able to exploit, you were getting nothing but padding. So. Yeah. And finally, you need a world that has no stack guards, a world that has kind of like things actually have gotten better, which is something nice to see here is that by default now, we're a little bit better. I mean, software is all inherently insecure, but we're getting a little bit better. So that was nice to see. So uh, again, in conclusion, this, uh, this exploit that we kind of saw, this uh, Halloween surprise from last November, this was less heart bleed and, you know, this was more paper cuts. Um, yeah. But and, again, uh, it didn't have a logo, so we had no. It didn't have. It yeah. didn't have a logo, so we had to create one. <laughs> yeah, we just no, made that yeah. in two seconds. Yeah. So, like, but yeah. Um, if anyone actually wants to talk about this stuff, um, feel free to. We'll be at the Invicti booth afterwards. Um, this is actually not particularly topical to what we do, but you know, we love just, security stuff. Yeah. And would love to chat. Um, if anyone has any questions, we do have, I think, a little bit of time remaining. A wee bit, yeah, yeah, a right, little bit. Good. Hopefully, we can. You know, any interaction is uh, welcome, either here or at the booth. Yeah, I've been involved in some of these, re releasing some of these bugs. I was um, vice president of the CERT IST, the French CERT. And I'm curious as to how this got out to be such a panic and such a hype before the professionals had a look at it. Because, I mean, when the Bind 9 Kaminsky book came out, 
we knew about it well ahead of time and we had it researched and checked and everything. So why the hype? Any idea? I have my theory. Um, my theory is that this was the first major bug coming out um, for OpenSSL with a high kind of severity impact. I think also until the patch was issued and we could do a deep dive to understand exactly the impact, I think, and, and I don't want to point fingers, there was somebody who ingested the uh, ability to issue CVEs, et cetera, that has that ultimate kind of classification. I think there might have been uh, a little bit of confusion on that classification with the impact and, and essentially blast radius that indicated this might be a more widespread uh, internet-based issue like Heartbleed, and they were trying to get ahead of it as a more preemptive or cautious type of action. Um, and then once it immediately got the scrutiny of researchers and experts around the world, it was, you know, within hours, it was moved to a high classification. So I think there was a little bit of a gap, uh, perhaps in the expertise and being a little bit also more cautious um, in the potential impact that related to that. Uh, I don't have an easy excuse, but that's my theory. I don't know if you have your own. Yeah, I think in this case, it was what came before, right? It was the experience of what happened the last time and the lack of information. I think that there was having knowledge that something was coming and that it was a critical was almost kind of the worst thing that can be done because absence any other information, people filled in their own details. And those details were, you know, I actually saw logos that had been made, right? Like I, I saw there were some people that were working on logos. So yeah, uh, I think absence of information, in my opinion, uh, a little bit sometimes is worse than none at all. You know, I was just wondering, there were comments back at the time of the Heartbleed that maybe the original EAY code was in need of revision. So, and I've done some patching of, uh, of that myself, and there, there were some weird things in there. What's the quality like now, or what do you think? Has it been rewritten, or is... The, the, there's, there, there are still issues in that code. Yeah. Um, we're, we're going to see more memory-related CVEs in that C code. Uh, and I don't think they're going to be very, and again, my, just my opinion, I don't think they're going to be easy to exploit, but we're not done. Um, th that, that code needs work. So I think that, again, this is speculation. Um, it's been years since I've changed the open SSO code, but, um, I think that the core code is actually a little bit better because of the scrutiny, right? Because of what happened after Heartbleed, you actually saw a bunch of forks. You saw a bunch of interesting activity. This vulnerability is in new code though. This is in code that was added only last year but was kind of implemented as a custom parser. So this is a difficult thing to say. I think that there have been many eyes that kind of do make for shallow bugs, but when it comes to dusty corners, if you look at where this was, when I was trying to figure out how this was called, I mean, this is a very strange windy passage within the open SSO code. This is not kind of core EAY, like, you know, actually uh, decrypting stuff. This is a dusty corner. Um, so I think that the, I do believe that more eyes is better. Um, however, Probably weren't that many eyes on this one. Yeah. I mean, take a look. When we prepared this uh, just last 7th. week, I think that that February 7th security advisory is probably part of the outfall of, uh, of this, of having people now taking a look at that new code and finding additional vulnerabilities. Any other questions? Nobody? All right. All right. Excellent. Well, hey, thank you all Thanks, very much everybody. for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you.